Welcome to Ain't That Swell, Core Lords, a very special episode today, Smivy, because it's not just you and me, brother. We've got uh, a special guest in the studio with us, none other than one of the founders of one of the most core, iconic, dirty, gritty, Aussie-sounding bands in the last 10 years. They've only been together for about three, although they've been best buddies forever. King Stingray, mate, I know the band strikes a chord with you, brother. Absolutely, mate. Uh, yeah, fully goatish in their short little yeah. tenure uh, in the pub rock scene. But, fully. mate, they are channeling the Warumpi band, Yothu Yindi, of course. We've got a descendant mm-hmm. of the great Yothu Yindi here. Uh, copped you guys at Splendor in the Grass. And, uh, mate, I actually cried. Eh? Oh, I cried. Wait. Roy Kellaway, mate. Should we introduce oh, him? Oh, yeah, <laughs> fucking up. Yeah, this guy. What He's an in intro. <laughs> yeah, Roy. Thanks for coming on, oh, brother. Mate, Good to see you. Thanks for having us, fellas. Yes, doing us all proud there, mate. Yeah. Seriously, like yeah. uh, it was, it was a big deal, and, and that's what I felt in the crowd that day at Splendor, mate. I cried yeah. like a fucking teenage oh. fan girl. And <laughs> I don't know if it was, you know, sleeping on the linoleum of Poochie's van or <laughs> the MDMA from the night before <laughs> and the four hours of sleep, but mate, it got to me. Everything and, uh, all at once. All at yeah. once, it just apex, and I was yeah. like, this is 
the absolute core of our nation yeah. black and white together sharing yeah. culture making art that was transcendent in such a mm. serious way mate so thank you oh, for that moment that was awesome that was when it was super muddy wasn't it i think was it was, yeah it was that one yeah it was yeah yeah and you guys were playing an early set which was i found bizarre yeah. i feel like you guys should be headlining being a, we, a local act of that caliber but. yeah we were stoked to have so many people rock up so early i think i've still got mud mm. engraved on my guitar case from that that's sick. It's, it's just like, that was a very muddy day, wasn't it? But yeah, that was awesome. Everyone came out nice and early and um, it definitely was a little, uh, it's one of those gigs we will remember. Mm. There's certain ones stick with you forever and they're just like something about them. Um, you know, hearing the crowd sing and at that point we had the record out so we were noticing people singing the words to, a, you know, the other songs that weren't, re like the album songs that weren't released up until the, you know, mm. to the album. So it was great just to hear the crowd getting into it. Yeah, Man, love it. It's the, the best art, the best music, it carries in it this this force that like connects you to the people around you and you feel this kind of sh solidarity, this shared experience with the artists, with your fans. Like it, it, it's a rare moment that you get to mm. experience that in life. You know, it's like yeah. only sport and great art that seems mm. to... Um, inspire that yeah and you know music's been bringing people together for thousands of years we know that uh, and you know it, we're definitely not reinventing the wheel there but uh, there's you know there's so much to be said about sharing songs together on stage and and singing about positive messages and um, you know fighting the good fight I think it's something that I think yeah when we we talk about you know what we're doing as a band and and as people, we sort of like to think that we're doing something a bit bigger than ourselves on an more, less on an individual level and more sort of broader than that, you know? Um, so yeah, having people, I guess, um, you know, receive music in a certain way and um, feel, feel the vibe and really get uh, something from it's really rewarding. Had like a really nice, um, you know, you get feedback now and then and people go, oh, you know, that was great or sick set and that's awesome. And then I had this guy at the airport recently just go, hey, mate, your music makes me feel real happy. Mm. And I was like, I haven't heard that as a bit of feedback before. And I was like, cheers, man. And I just like, had this spring in my step. I was like, that feels great. He was just like, just wanted to, to let me know that the music makes him feel good. And I'm like, freaking how good is yeah. that? Yeah. It's trippy because like the Yothu Yindi story and like that music is, is something, it's a legacy, it's part of your family line and then you've got King Stingray which is continuing on that legacy in a almost a grittier way but yeah. like you're getting two different completely different sets of, I don't know, ages, crew I guess but they're all coming out experiencing two different sides of those two different stories. What's that like for you guys? Yeah, totally. You know, we, I think, What's really important for us as well is, is you know, grabbing that baton and, and that legacy that was, you know, Yothi Indi and what they did mm. and continue to do and really run with it and keep that ball rolling. Something my Wawa Yeringa always talks about is got to keep the ball rolling. And I just love that. I love that saying. And um, that's what we're doing. We're giving it a, a, giving it a red hot crack, you know, because we're, we're super proud and, and feel there's so much to celebrate about, you know, living in such a beautiful place like Australia and for us it really does mean a lot to be able to have a have a presence and a, and a bit of a, a platform to share a story so we feel very lucky and privileged to to do that and have mm. that position to to share something and a bit of education on the way we've yeah. noticed that some of the crowd uh can sing a bit of younger matter and have a crack you know maybe they're messing it up but they're, they're giving it a go and we love that and and it's really, um, it's really special because, you know, coming from a very small part of the world and a tiny little community, and then you're playing gigs down south or even overseas, and and sharing that cultural exchange and, and you know mm. that sort of, th I guess that um, that process is a pretty cool concept. Um, yeah, I don't know. And I think the you know Yoth Yindi, um, obviously have had a massive impact on us, um, you know, as kids and, you know, we're Yothi Indy's biggest fans mm. and, 
you know, it's a really big part of our life. It's who we are. It's part of our fabric of cultural cel celebration, I guess. And uh, keeping that in modern sort of contemporary world, you know, um, as young fellas, we want to we keep keep that legacy going and um, have have that presence in Australia. Um, and and we really feel very lucky for. Mm. A lot of the kids, like um, lots of school kids, we do a lot of old, all ages gigs. Um, we did a couple of shows at the Maya Bowl in Melbourne last year, and we sold it out at the Maya Bowl. And it was all it was all um, school kids. Mm. So we had like thirty school buses come in. Some drove like four hours from their school in rural Victoria. Um, it was classic because the kids were louder than the PA. They were screaming so loud because our sound guy because we. Didn't want to blow the ears off yeah. the kids, you know. Yeah. Um, and he, we had, you know, no, we couldn't play too loud. And we're a pretty loud rock band. We love cranking it up. Um, but the kids were so, so loud, screaming. Mm. We felt like such rock stars walking out. And then they were like, ah! these like grade three to like six or something, I think it was. Oh, man. It was such a yeah. vibe. And that was a really, really special moment having that sort of, you know, lifespan of, you know, kids and, you know, parents yeah. all there having fun and you kind of, yeah, you wonder is it, are the kids into it because their parents are into it or are the kids genuinely into it? I feel like now I've realised, I think the kids are, kids are oh, into it. They're definitely into it, man. I remember the first time I heard Yothu India was, uh, I was at home with my family like most families were when there was only two channels with living up here. Yeah. And it was a Saturday night, 6.30 or thereabouts. Hey, hey, it's Saturday. was on Molly Meldrum, introduced Yothu Yindi. Yeah, wow. And that was when I first heard him. And, man, I swear by the end of that month, maybe the end of that year, every single kid in every school in this whole country was singing Treaty. Yeah. Like probably the treaty, first time. Yabana, mate. Yeah, all any time, time in Australian awesome history where school kids are singing yeah. about something that genuinely – was at the heart of mm. a really massive issue in this country, like singing in one voice, you know. Yeah, for sure. And, um, yeah, I think uh, one thing we were talking about before, as well as just the pure musical connection that you get from those songs and the underlying message in them, it's so sick that it didn't just relate to Australians, man. It hit that world doof scene. Yeah. And you guys just <laughs> yeah. were, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, in the first incarnation of the band on the cutting edge mm. of dance music around the world, just yeah. sending crew who had no idea, yeah. just like into the cultural fucking mm. um, astral realm, Smithy. Gapu, the title remix. Yeah. 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 Hey, that's a trip hop <laughs> yeah. track for the ages. Yeah. I listen to it every day while I'm doing my Wim Hof. My yeah. Hof. So good. But, but yeah, I think that's just yeah. undeniable that it hits chord somewhere mm. in you that uh, it's just one of those magic moments in yeah. time man. but it comes from as you said this tiny little corner on the very northeastern tip of mm. the nt man the probably one of the most remote community still only has what's your color's population like less than a thousand people still oh yeah it'd be less than a thousand yeah. how yeah. man how did these places yeah. generate these world-changing Events and, and moments. And um, Jeffy uh, Unipingu is from up that way yeah. too, right? Yeah. yeah. Just smashed yeah. the global yeah. music yeah. scene, destroyed yeah. it, rest in peace. Mm. Mm. Yeah, there's some seriously big hitters that have come out of that small little part of the world. And it's so interesting because, yeah, you, you zoom out and you see Yirikala and, you know, Northeast Arnhem Land on the map. And it's this little blip on the map if you look at the whole world. Mm. But so many leaders, so many, um, like a massive you know, cultural, um, it, there's, there's so many, I, I guess it's, it's something I've thought about for sure, because mm. it's like in such a small place, we've, we've had such big moments in time in history and particularly, you know, obviously in Australian history, but, um, from the bark petition signings in 1963 and my namesake Roy Marika and the Nalapal members of, um, that basically brought land rights movement to, to parliament. So um, this was uh, part of Eddie Marbo's na is, native title stuff? Is, is that right? It's kind of in the same same mm. sort of space, but it was a land rights um, thing. Right. And um, yeah, it was, it, we saw, we actually played a gig at Parliament House this year, which was really cool. And um, and we saw the Bach petition signings, they have them up in, in Parliament House. Wow. And um, 
you know, it was just amazing for the boys particularly to see these really, really, you know, truly um, special artifacts, you know, in real life mm. and and to see everyone's signature, all the Nullipult's writing and signatures on it. It was pretty special, you know, um, and, you know, there's obviously such, such a big, I mean, the, the arts centre there is a really big, it's like the nucleus of town for us, I feel. Mm. Um, the, the art centre there and and definitely we, um, you know, we're lucky enough to have access to, to musical instruments as kids and, you know, it's a, you know, music's a really big part of life up there. Give, give us a rundown about <laughs> the place and, you know, the landscape of the biodiversity, the culture of the joint and, and you know, how uh, – and, and then we'll feed that into sort of, you know, the, the, your musical journey and some yeah. of the influences that have fed into King yep. Stingray. Yeah, yeah. So, beautiful place. Like, I guess um, a lot of people want to know what it's like and it is – it's so unique. You've got to go and, and experience it yourself uh, – the people but it's it's a place that obviously i hold very very dear to my heart and has had a very profound impact on my life um the the landscapes are so i feel like they're pretty exclusive to that area these really dark greens of the trees and then this really red bauxite um you know rocky ground and and these sort of deep deep green seas Mm. Um, different to down here where it's like these sort of crystal blues. It's still crystal clear out there, but this sort of crystal green. Mm. Um, and yeah, the, just the colors, it's, it's so much. Like the smells when I go up there as well, like, oh man, we're up there in um, August this year um, for this Billabong Bonkai Lab and yeah. we did some music up there too at the Gama Festival. Um, and, you know, the smell of dry season mornings up there, it's just like hits you like something about it you know just the nostalgia at its highest possible level and just boom in yeah it. you just like i don't know what it is it's like the birds the this there's something about the dry season mornings i just love and what's it's, the deal with like um you know like temperatures and stuff is it always the, you're right in the thick of it like you're mm. on the very tip of the continent yeah um, it's real warm it's super yeah. warm but you know, it's not as hot as Darwin, I feel. Always t when we go to Darwin, by the way, Darwin's like, it's 15 hours drive east. Yeah. Oh, sorry. West. West, yeah. If you're at Yerka. Um, and I don't know, it's because Darwin's a big sort of bay, um, harbour thing. So we're on the coast. We get a bit more of a sea breeze. Mm. Um, yeah. And hence we get a bit of surf, a bit more than Darwin. Tell us about yeah. the rollers, bro. Is there yeah. like... <laughs> what is There's it? trim like, ups to be had yeah. for sure. Like <laughs> it puts, you know, puts you, I guess, in in a perspective. Like when it's small and crumbly and crappy here. Yeah. Me and Dad getting a bit picky now because we've been down here a few years. But if that was up in Ireland, we'd be frothing like, man, it's pumping, and you just <laughs> go for it. So it's really nice that concept of not not being so picky about going for a surf because you never regret it you never miss a go out as mm. george greeno says never miss a go out yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. So, agreed <laughs> and it's just such a you know yeah. that's a really i think that can be applied to a lot in life um just got to keep rolling it over and you know it there's definitely surf though like i don't want to tell everyone because everyone will go there and it'll be <laughs> Turn into bloody well. Byron you can Bay. put people off by telling people <laughs> what you're surfing with. Oh, I mean, on, on the east yeah, coast, we're talking about blue bottles and yeah, uh, what yeah. the odd, the odd like I don't know, mm. body bite that yeah. uh, might sw swim up and down the coast. But you've got yeah. a whole different set of yeah. There's lots that can get you up there. <laughs> there's so much like, but the you know when you're living there and you and you're local, it's it's kind of you know it's that calculated risk, I guess and. Um, my dad was working as a ranger up there, so <clears throat> had good intel about what crocs were on the move and where. And, um, you know, I guess it's an interesting thing because I grew up going surfing with my old man. A lot of time it was just me and my old man. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> There's no one else. And so you're kind of under that sort of wing of your dad and that false sense of security. And my dad's a chiller. like He's, a, he's the ultimate chiller. But it's only as I've gotten older, I've realized he's really into like adrenaline type, like, it, you know, 
he's not a, he's a he's a pretty courageous guy and i think because he's such a relaxed chill dude you it kind of i never really thought about that i, mm. I you know he wouldn't do anything risky but no he does some risky stuff in the water and <laughs> and surfing with crocs is something that you know you you do up there um if you want to get the viz, you're going to have to uh, yeah. deal with a couple of big reptiles on on the way yeah. out or way well, in. <laughs> yeah, it's there's so many great spots and like I think actually you know for me I was actually a bit more I never really thought about the crocs too much. It's kind of like down here you don't want to think about the sharks because mm. mm. you just like otherwise you'll never go out. Yeah. It's like what's the so um, I don't know. Definitely the stingers up there is also a big risk. Got a few good buddies that the got Eric stung Cup. by Erkanji. Yeah. Oh man. And they're brutal experiences. Like, um, did sailing up there, and my mate Julian got stung as a kid, and I remember it being horrific for him. Um, he like basically collapsed on the beach, and um, it was this old yachty because it was at the yacht club who mm. who saw him at the just hit the deck, and he was like this, you know, really experienced um, yachty out there who who straight away was like, oh, I think I know what's going on. He picked him up chucked him in the tray of his ute and drove him to the hospital. And Julian was like rolling around. He tells me the story. He's just like vomiting, everything, the excruciating, going in and out of consciousness. Yep. Like it's a brutal experience, the Irukanji. And, um, and he still has like some long-term, like he gets like prickly heat, that nerve wow. neurological thing as he puts on shirts and things like that. Like it rocked him. Yep. Wow. Um, no, I've heard a few yeah. it's like close to death stories. Yeah. I, uh, like, guys going into rooms and talking about seeing the light mm, yeah. and saying that the pain of an Irukandji mm. survival is as gnarly as anything like mm. yeah. yeah i met a bloke at a dwarf and he was telling me that he got stung up in the northwest mm. and uh the local mob up there they buried him up to his neck in, in boiling hot sand and stood around him and pissed on him yeah to um, like like i don't like yeah and it saved his life yeah so, well there's so fuck man there's yeah, methods. methods for sure. I mean, my sister, we were at Yellingbro, uh, 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 homeland, really remote. This is really remote. And um, she got stung by a box jellyfish as a kid. And those things can kill you. Mm. Well, they're different, are they? Yeah. I don't even know they're different. So, right? Irukandji are like tiny. They feel like a, a sea lice has got you, not even a sting, initial sting. It's like oh. half an hour afterwards you no get. No way. Yeah. Um, get like that intense thing afterwards but a boxy is like straight away you know extreme i'm yeah i'm no jellyfish like scientist but that's all i know about yeah. it too and the the boxy is like can be super lethal yeah. like you can die really quickly um but my sister um so yalme who's mundawoy's the lead singer from yotini's yep. wife um who i call amala mum she's um a really, really special person and has had a massive impact um, on our lives. But um, someone who I love very dearly, mm. she basically saved my sister's life and, and heated up a moaka. Moaka is a flower that grows on the beach up there. And she heat up this leaf with the smoke of a fire and you put it on the burn and um, it absorbs, I think, I'm assuming it absorbs the the toxins. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, my sister was fine. I mean, she yeah. got a little scar, but she you know live to tell the tale yeah and so isn't that mad man pretty like, amazing yeah it's amazing mm. yeah the various like secret uh or, or or hidden solutions that are buried yeah. in the desert and in it reminds me of in the the natives in uh the amazon and, mm. and just how they know every piece of bark and sap and like yeah. all these antidotes oh. to a million different things that we don't know yeah well i remember um when i was in uh, Maxville High, you know, some of the mob around there would always tell you, like, if you get stung by something in, in the bush or if you get, you know, bitten by something or whatever, there's always a solution within a few feet wow. that you can crush up some sort of, you know, poultice that you can put on it and ease that pain almost instantly. Makes sense. Grew up with that, like, yeah. out the back of um, Barraville. Yeah, wow. it's mad. That, but, yeah. But, mate, like, um, far out, like, just before we get back into the music, mm. like, just your, your surfing grommet hood. Because clearly, you know, you've teamed up with uh, Billy's now and you've got your... I'm pro rider now. Look at, look at the band, dude. It's everywhere. And, like, I know this came, This this is a cool story how, you know, yeah, you hooked up with Odie. But just tell us a bit about your, your grommet hood. Like, was there other surfers your age where you were growing up surfing? Did your old man have a few mates who surfed? 
Were you access yeah. the boards? Were you waxing up with freaking candles? Like, oh, totally. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, yeah, I can't imagine yeah. there'd be like that many surf shops out there. No, no, not much. <laughs> but it, yeah, I mean, I don't know where to start. I guess, you know, my, my dad's very keen surfer yeah. and, um, and he, he often would get real stoked when the cyclones come through. So, um, you get a lot of these low pressure systems sort of mm. bubbling away in the Gulf of Carpentaria and they push and push up into northeast Arnhem Land and, you know, it's it's pretty gnarly conditions of surfing because it's, uh, you know, it's messy, dirty brown water, there's crap in the water mm. and it's super windy. So it's like the opposite to down here, like, um, you know, my idea of like when the surf's pumping is it's blowing a gale and you're like, yeah, the surf's on. Yeah, yeah. And so you race out. Whereas here, it's like there's no wind. You're like, oh, it'll be on. It's a totally different mm. feeling. But um, yeah, I I was inspired a lot by um, also my godfather Scotty Scott Welsh, um, and and dad and um, yeah, we would come down here for like uh, a lot of like Christmas holidays. We've got family and friends down this way, and would get get waves in and stuff like that yeah and that's where i get my board i remember getting my first board at mc's michael kind of lived. yeah no way yeah dude. yeah and old sky uh no oh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. actually um i had a real epic um experience on uh, an old sky board of um scotty's that was one of his when he he was he bought it's his first ever board actually it was no really awesome shape like heaps of volume up at the chest yeah paddles real well single fin um but yeah i i guess i um i got it the sort of um the bug from my dad and and then surfing up there in arnhem land you know it's such an adventure and an experience we had our local beach shady beach which i lived yeah I, for a period of time the house we had was like the closest house to the beach so i was like this is the, this is awesome um but you just live in the dream, like yeah. every grom. If, yeah. you, if, you, if your house is the closest one to the beach, yeah, and you see sheets of corrugated iron flying down the street, yeah. and the surf's on, you're fucking yeah. laughing. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> oh, it's just so, so uh, such a, um, you know, amazing part of life. And like looking back at those times, um, there's lots of little surf spots. Mm. We, you know, the other one was boat ramps. It was at the boat ramp when it was real big cyclone swell. It's the only place they can handle. It was this big sort of right hand appealing off um we call it the carver grinding chest out the front there's this big flat rock um and the house sort of adjacent to it mm. was this old fijian fellow who used to deal sell all the carver up there yeah yeah and um, we'd call it his grinding his carver <laughs> grinding rock no way. and would take off sort of just on the rock there and um that was the spot to go to when it was really like a you know big swell big cyclone swell um, but Shady Beach is a left-hander sort of mm. bomby type wave. And then out further, again, there's another bomby we call it out of Cortez. <laughs> like, classic. Um, so classic. So yeah. good. And I'm um, goofy footer. It's a little left-hander. Not much of a, a long ride. Like it's, you can get b little barrels though because it's like a sort of a bomby wave. Yeah. Um, and um, then for, sort of beyond that, there's about a, about a half an hour paddle is this island. And um, we used to paddle it out to it on like long boards. Um, and there was a right hander that peeled off that island. Um, a bloody awesome moment in time was, um, so my dad started uh, one of the, the first Yungo run or one of the first indigenous run surf clubs mm. up there. Um, and this was years ago. And it was such an awesome time because uh, there was there was all these sort of water sports going on on weekends and you know i just love love getting in the water and then having more people in the water was such a fun moment because it most of the time it was just me and my dad and mm. um maybe a couple of his mates um there's some characters you know we all we all the little the small little crew uh i guess uh, yeah sam brumby who's a mate i grew up with up there who shoots a lot of stuff with us his old man was our indonesian teacher and um he was a very brave surfer too. He'd always be going for it when it's real big. Yeah. And often it'd be, yeah, him and my dad and myself out. Um, and also another buddy of mine, Keegan Kelly, used to charge it. Um, but yeah, the time when we got, had the surf club going was just the best because we got all this, uh, you know, 
sort of watercraft um, donated to the to the surf life the surf club. Mm. So we had these two shipping containers at Shady Beach, and we had surf rescue boards. We had like surf skis, and we used to paddle to the island and trawl and just do a hand line out with the surf skis, and you just pull in a little trevally and and then you know. It was just, it was unbelievable. We had um, Dave Rastovich come up, or yeah, it is up, yeah, come up for um, the sort of opening ceremony of it. And he donated a bunch of boards oh and stuff. Way. And I was, it was, I was just like, it was a spin out because he was like my favourite surfer. Yeah. yeah. And then here he is surfing my local on a clubby board, getting barreled on these, on those big yeah. yellow clubby boards. And it was just so uh, like I, I couldn't even believe what I was seeing, mate. That is it just was so yeah, iconic. and it, oh, it was crazy because he, I know, and <laughs> yeah. as he came, this really awesome swell came in, mm. um, and it was solid. It was like five, six foot left handers at Shady Beach, all time conditions for Shady Beach, yeah. And um, here he is just trimming up, and then like it's when I witnessed him do the full body surf all the way through, yeah just full water man just like because he yeah he came off on the clubby board and obviously no leggy or anything and he mm. just rode this wave all the way through <laughs> it's like what? i was just tripping you know as a, a little yeah. fellow and um yeah it's a really really freaking awesome <sighs> time to have like all those mate that is so, such yeah, a legitimate it? surf grommet hood yeah. that i would just never have expected that far north mm. oh yeah that's crazy man that's yeah amazing. there's it honestly is, it's just such a, I could talk about it all day because yeah. I, I just love it, you know. I froth hard and, you know, as you were talking about before, you froth yeah. your local and you love your your local even if it's not perfect. But I think that's why you do froth it. Um, yeah, man. There's like, there's so much to be said about something that, um, you know, isn't necessarily perfect. And oh, mate, it's, look, yeah. it's mate, weird. I'll, Aside from the box jellyfish and the crocs, <laughs> yeah. I can relate to almost every little sensation that you're talking yeah. about. I even have an Oki and Luke turn up to my home break one time and surf it and just the feeling that I had from that, like yeah. like gods had arrived. You know, it was, yeah. it was bizarre. And, yeah. And seeing them surf and stuff. But what about, mate, just with, um, you know, the actual cultural connection that you have personally with a couple of big moments in surf, uh, in the surf realm – which is uh, obviously Yothi Yindi's combination to the Jack McCoy films. That's, that was a huge, huge moment. The Jack McCoy films kind of changed everything. You know, Green mm. Iguana and Bunny mm. of Dreaming and, and Yothi Yindi played a yeah. huge part of that. Yeah. So, you know, I've heard that you described uh, or, or it's been described King Stingray as sort of Yonu's surf rock. Mm. Is there that connection through those films and like, there's definitely that. something there for sure. Did you watch those when you were growing up? Yeah, I remember having the... I can't believe Dad's yeah, bands on this soundtrack, The <laughs> Bunny of Dreaming, I, I'm having it on VHS. Yeah. I think Dad's still got it somewhere. I need to dig it up. But, um, you know, that like that is the coolest shit for me. Like yeah. That stuff really excites me. And as kids, you know, Yiddinger and I always talked about doing this this project. And we played, um, you know, we played music together in different little school bands and all mm. these... So Yidinga uh, is Yipsy? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you two guys have been mates since before you had memories? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. You know, since So his uncle is... Um, Dr. M. Yeah. Dr. M. Yeah. Who is the lead singer of Yothi Yindi. Oh, Mandawoy. You know? yeah, yeah, that's it. Exactly. Mandawoy. And um, so that's his uncle. Mm. And then you two just, what, up through osmosis, picked up instruments, just started jamming together or... Yeah, well... Pretty much. I mean, so my dad was the music teacher up there at Yitakala CC, the school there. Mm. And, uh, you know, people who were really into into the music there was, was Yiranga. He was actually a drummer as when we were kids. He was the drummer. Um, and and Dimmer, also a drummer. Everyone wants to play drums because it's pretty yeah. fun. And, um, but, you know, we played a lot of music at the school in the music room and we'd be getting the keys off Stu. Yeah. Can we get the music room keys? And we just jam and um, muck around up there. I lived across the road from the school, so um, it was just really close. Um, and Dimo lived on the same street as me, Bulungalma Road. Still does, just down the road. Actually, no, he's just moved. He got a new place. But, um, yeah, you know, we'd go there and play music as kids. Yeah. Um, but then as Jitting and I started t touring with Yoth Yindi, 
was um, when we really kind of were like, okay, let's let's go out on our own and and let's um, let's keep this you know keep the ball rolling mm. pretty much. And um, we we always spoke about making this making our own band and making um, this young or surf rock. I always wanted to do this young or surf rock project um, where you know I, I love surf music. I love um, I love surf rock and I love like big surf guitar yeah. and, you know um that's something I'm really into but we always spoke about it and then when we started doing some gigs with Yachty Indy it was like a couple of years of that touring on the road and we were like this is amazing and and you know you're feeling you can't help but to think about the moment of like say when Yachty Indy were taken off you know I was thinking about my dad and mm. and family in Yothi Indy and how young they were too and that feeling of when you're a young band giving it a crack and things had taken off it it honestly f- pumps you up your, your soul up with so much excitement and it's a really cool feeling you know um and I, you know couldn't help but to think about what it would have felt like for them as a little band from Arnhem Land um then things are going a certain way and then next minute they're touring overseas and blown up in the in the in Europe and Germany and winning ARI awards and everything else it's like such a crazy um you know as a music froth as a music lover yeah. that is like that is so exciting to think about <laughs> I, and it's like I you just want to do imagine it imagine coming from Arnhem Land you've got these this world changing music you end up in Germany when you know the whole dance music scene's kicking mm. off and you're just looking at these faces in the crowd <laughs> just <laughs> Black pupils as that round just gurning off their heads. Oh, it's going. David Bowie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mate. Oh, it's amazing, man. But but yeah. just on that surf sound that you were talking about, like you've got a direct line to Warumpi band as well in mm. the band. Yeah, yeah. So that's mad. Dimmer, that's the f- his uncle, uh, sorry, grandfather is George yeah, Warumpi. No yeah, way. isn't that Warumpi. mad? Yeah, that's so wild. Like direct lineage with yeah. Warumpi the band. Two, two of the greatest yeah. Australian bands, greatest bands in yeah. the planetary history. Fully. The descendants, <laughs> mate. The pedigree's off. I know. Its teeth. <laughs> wow. It's amazing, and I feel yeah. like that's you know, growing up as as kids. We all were really inspired by Yotini, obviously, but also mm. Warumpi Band a lot, and and George particularly. Um, the way he performs, he's just he's just a powerhouse. I don't know if you guys ever got lucky enough to see him perform, but just phenomenal. Mm. And um, and yeah, I've got this boat that he carved for me because he used to live in my bedroom for years, um, and he carved this boat out of this wood and a little sailing like a toy. I was a kid, mm. and he and he. And he um, he's wrote a note on it. Thanks for letting me use your room. Um, and it's so, like one of my most prized possessions. Sure, man. Because I just, you know, oh, yeah, love yeah. that man. And um, just the the power, the, the spirit of him, you know, like when um, he was he was really crook and, you know, he, he didn't have much long left. And my mum tells this story where he, when people pass away um, as a, um, like a sense, what did you call it? Like a, um, they barricade the roads, block them off, like a sensitive, like don't go here. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah um, for Bapuru, the ceremony. So he heard, he was in hospital still and he heard that they barricaded the road already and he wasn't dead yet and he, had all, it was all hooked up, you know, he's in hospital, he's, he's crook as a dog, like mm. he's got cancer, he's, he's really on his last moments. He rips it all up and he hops out onto the street and he goes, I'm not fucking dead yet. <laughs> and to the, you know, yeah. it's just a classic like, yeah. example of this man who to the very end was just full strength, but the la ganjar, that mm. power, like that ganjar is that power mm. and that's him, like he sort of personified that and for us um you know he's definitely a big inspiration as a person um musically but also as a person and he's like intent and the warumpi band really like you can feel and hear warumpi in what Mm. you guys do it's it's much more stripped back it's got a real earthy Mm. sort of kicker yeah in the middle of it and um yeah there's just something real familiar 
yeah. that you're recreating in your own way though. For sure. With what King Stingray are doing. I think there's, it's obviously something, you know, it, it's, I guess it makes sense when people say that because, you know, growing up in the bush, you don't have sort of, yeah, I mean, definitely we, we didn't have Spotify. I guess that's a more mm. recent thing. And like, I, I think you'd, you'd probably call it like professional exposure to music. You just don't have that up there. Also, I kind of was born in that time where I sort of just like maybe all those different streaming platforms weren't around. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm young fella, but I was like, I don't know. Maybe it's because I was remote. Everything kind of got delayed getting there. <laughs> so maybe there was these streaming platforms at the time, but we didn't know and didn't have use of it. Um, so the music we listened to was pretty much Yacht the Indie, Warumpi Band. Yeah. Um, you know, mostly young artists and... Yeah, that's kind of... Not a bad influence, mate. No, yeah. <laughs> Not bad yeah. at all. And what did you learn from these bands, like the Wurumpi band, Yothi Indy? You know, what messages, what greater purpose did they uh, pass on to you? I think for me, the, the broadly, like the concept of just giving it a red hot crack, you know. All about giving it a red hot crack. Yeah, <laughs> giving it a crack. <laughs> I mean, it, I, that, I really feel... Like that resonates well um, with myself. I, you know, I, I suppose I can't really talk on behalf of everyone, but seeing uh, people from a small town just going for it and following their dreams. I know it sounds super cliche and everyone talks about it, uh, you know, follow your dream, do what you want to do. Obviously a lot easier said than done, but um, it makes me realise like, how amazing those particular individuals are and and what they did the work that goes behind becoming a, a you know a um a well-known artist or you know mm -hmm. having i don't really like using the word success but like that sort of concept there's heaps of work that goes into oh, it yeah you know? man. And I, that's was one thing i wanted to ask <laughs> you like being in your through indie <clears throat> you're kind of in an established band you're in a band that a lot of people love from the bottoms of their hearts have a lot of sentimental attachment to when you start going out as King Stingray you know you you and all the boys you're from this little outpost you must have done some raucous early shows they must have oh, done yeah. some outpost gigs in the middle Definitely. of nowhere that were just fucking next level bro. totally and <laughs> it's it's they're some of the best little moments, Fully you know. man. Any classics oh. that's come to mind where you're just like looking out there going where are we what is yeah, this yeah all the time I mean because we, I'm really big on the DIY, yeah, sort of get shit done yourself approach. Um, me and my dad are, are really passionate about about that, and and mm. another fellow, Chris Keo, who's a Nulan boy, born and bred local, who's a a really big mentor for me and musically and as as a person as well. And he's really kind of been um, very inspirational for me in terms of like he said something to me when I was a kid. And I just love it. He just says, do it yourself. It's more fun that way. Mm. And as I've gotten older and working, learning more about industry, music industry, the more shit you can do yourself, the more involved you are and the more stoked you get and more like self um, feeling of like, fuck, that was great. You know, like the more involved you are, I think in general. And um, that, that sort of, yeah, concept of just giving it a red hot crack. So like when, you know, we Yiding and I are talking about this project. Yeah, we wonder Young or Surf Rock. All right, how are we gonna do it? We need we need to we need to record some of these songs. Because we've been jamming these songs since, you know, school. Yeah. We got the songs there. As they say, you got your whole life to make your first album. So we're pulling pulling into our, you know, back catalogue of yeah. this some of our favourites and um Rapery, I think, was one of the first songs. I remember Yiding and jamming that one in the music room. And he's just getting so in. He's on the guitar and he's jumping up on the table, pushing off the pencils, and he's just rocking out. Yeah, as um in the Arvo, and you know, so we're like, okay, we've got to record these songs. So COVID hit, and I was um finding working from home. I was working in Aboriginal healthcare in Brizzy mm. at the time, and uh, was doing all this telehealth. So I was able to work from home, and it took away all the commuting because I used to drive a fair bit. I used to go out to like Western Queensland, out to Kunnamulla for work, mm -hmm. work at the Aboriginal Medical Clinic out there. And because I was working from home, I had all this extra time in the day because I wasn't traveling so much. So I was going crazy with the grant writing, trying to get some funds to record and, and put this Young or Surf Rock project, you know, mm. 
the, the I guess the the myth and make it a thing. Yep. And um, that process of grant writing uh, kind of mapped out, organised my thoughts a bit. You know, as you sort of yarning up an idea, it can be pretty scattered. I know for me, anyways, it's like you've got these ideas and it's not real well organised thoughts. How, how are you going to do it? So the the grant process was like mapping. All right, this is what we need to do. Yeah. Here we go. And um, yeah, we 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 were really lucky. We got an Australian Arts Council grant to record, like it was like three or four songs. Yeah. And um, basically, used that funds. I ended up recording for virtually free because we recorded at home at Tintin Bar, mom and dad's place at the time. They moved down south, and dad's been me and dad have been working on a little studio there in the shed. So me and Yeringa recorded the these songs all ourselves just in the studio there. And um, we put out the first song, which was Hey Wanaka. And um, we, I just hustled on that DIY process yeah. of like um, putting together like a one-page presser, like who we are, we're doing Jung or Surf Rock, where we're from, telling that story because, you know, the story is really important for us. We mm. love the story is such a really, you know, you know, a really big part. And um, I found out that the Triple J mob were all like, emails were all like last name dot first name at abc.net.au mm. or whatever. So just spammed them and sent as to all the contacts I had and um, went hard with the, you know, the hustle trying to get some radio play for this first song and I'm getting to your answer. Yeah. Oh, your question. No, I'm loving it, a very roundabout like, this way. This is like a full blueprint and pathway <laughs> yeah. to any grommet who has a dream and is sort of waiting around for it to just fall into their yeah. laps. Like even just the grant writing, man, that seems like such a fucking bureaucratic mm. headache for most people who might yeah. have the talent and no. the skill and can't get a leg up in any mm. way, shape or form because they're being ground down yeah. by having to work full time or whatever. For sure. Like, this is a perfect learned, pathway, yeah. man. I feel yeah. like I've... I've learned, like, if I look back at this, this is like three years ago now. I've yeah. learned so much since then. And, um, you know, it's really boring stuff. But you kind of, because I love music. Yeah. And it was something I never wanted to do, all that other stuff. You just want to, as a musician, you just want to make songs and yeah. play gigs. And so I never thought about being a bit more planned or organized. <laughs> but this, I guess, because COVID, we couldn't really tour. It was sort of all... I think I was also at that point where I've played in lots of little indie rock bands around the place and I was like, right, here we go. I'm going to, I'm going to try and organize my thoughts a bit and be a bit, um, yeah. be a bit more strategic, I guess. And, um, yeah. And, and then with your question about like sort of raw early gigs, mm. we recorded these songs, right. And we didn't really have the band. It was just me, Yitting and Dimmer at the time basically selling the dream, talking about this all the time. We had never really done a gig, just us yeah. as King Singer. We've played music our whole lives in different bands and under different names and everyone on different instruments. Um, as I said, Yeringa was a drummer mostly and then became more of a vocalist and Dimmer was a straight up drummer master. So he, was, he wasn't he was um, much of a guitarist at that point, but he's a bloody good guitarist. And so when we're pulling the band together, we're like, all right, let's try this and and yips is like yeah i'm freaking keen as because he was singing with yothi and he was really rocking it yeah um, and the so first song was out hey wanaka and you know we were doing the full diy hustle and um uh the chats there's they're like a punk band from sunny yeah. coast love the chats yeah. yeah so one of my good mates louis ground core <laughs> yeah. like oh they're the awesome. diy specialist man. exactly yeah and you know, I love their approach and yeah. um, they're just legends. They're all such great fellas. Yep. Um, their label, Bargain Bin Records, um, heard our song and were like, hey, fellas. Oh, actually, it, it all kind of came back because um, a good mate of mine, Louis, who was drumming on the on the songs for King Sting, um, he was also playing in a band with Eamon from the Chats, yep. like a, a punk band called Headlice which was just like a, a Good name, raucous man. little, um, yeah, they were awesome. <laughs> and uh, this is all going on around Brizzy? Yep, this is Brizzy. Because Brizzy is the home of Aussie punk from the Saints onwards. Yeah. And, you know, the Sir Joe fucking Nazi fascist era where they were yeah. cracking down on the punks. Yeah. So uh, Brizzy is still kind of the spiritual home oh. of Aussie punk rock in my opinion. Brizzy's, i got so much good stuff to say about Brizzy, mm. you know. 
I guess, um, you know, it often gets a bit of a, a bad rap from people say from, you know, musically, like it's definitely a place that f- for me is so many awesome bands mm. coming out of Brizzy. Yeah. Um, and I remember reading a, um, oh, sorry, I'm getting so sidetracked here. <laughs> this whole like, show is just sidetracked. Side side <laughs> <off, laughs> <all right>. <laughs> I'm into it. Yeah. All right, I'll keep going. <laughs> yeah. Nah, keep going. But man. the, um, I think it was one of the fellows from the Saints was talking, or maybe the Go Betweens was talking about Brizzy as a really good sort of, not breeding ground, but like a birthing moment as a, mm. for a band because you don't have a lot of punters there, like Melbourne, who go and see live music. It's more you go to the, the pub to get on the piss rather than go see a band. Mm. And so it makes you really sort of scrutinize your show. And I played in, I was, went to uni in Brizzy, so I was playing in bands up there and, um, you really kind of think how the hell are we going to get people to come to our show and how they're going to be into it. So you you really do work on your your show and you think about it a lot because you you know you you got to try and draw these people in because it's like they need a little bit more yeah. <laughs> of a pool. You yeah. know, there's not that real strong punter thing like in Melbourne and whatnot. Um, so I feel like it's really good for that. You really scrutinize your show yeah and i don't know. mate i love that that you served an apprenticeship a punk rock apprenticeship yeah. in the spiritual home of aussie punk oh and exactly punk rock. it's <laughs> magic man and then yet you're from Urukala, and then so you, you then go back or at around about this time you're connecting with your roots and with this nation's sixty thousand plus year old roots and you're connecting culture pub rock and indigenous culture and in that connecting of cultures is like the greatest gift to humanity and it's a, a, there's a weird cosmic truth in it. Like mm. the best bands of all time are all mixed race. Mm. The Specials, the Jimi Hendrix mm. experience, the Warumpi band, Yothu Yindi, Sly and the Family Stone. Uh, mate, I could go on and on and mm. on. And it just seems that like for me, uh, there's this truth that like when we connect as cultures, when we share like music and, and story, that we take humanity, we take our species to another level. It creates art and music and culture that is transcendent. And it, mate, yeah, you guys are yeah. flying that flag hard. I, for sure. And I guess people would see that. We certainly don't actually think about that because we're just mates and we're family playing music together. We don't really look at those sort of intricacies. So, I mean, it's, it's great that people can kind of get that message from mm. what we're doing. Uh, but in essence, we're just a family band full of mates and um, we're having a lot of fun playing music. And that, yeah, I don't know, it's just, it's... It's, um, well, it's a touch point for white people to engage with that, with our indigenous culture. Because sure. it's not always that easy, you know, mm. for people. Like, I think it's like one in 10 Australians has never met an indigenous person. Mm. So, and I, I feel like though there is a real desire to engage, but mm. it's just not always that easy. Do you feel that when you're playing shows that there's this real desire amongst the, the people in the crowd to connect with indigenous culture and, mm. and, and support and encourage and, and just celebrate? Definitely. You know, there's something really systemically wrong with Australia with what's taught in schools as well about the, you know, true history of Australia, you know. Um, so a lot of kids are missing out on learning the the genuine story of black Australia and the history of Australia. You know, we learn about Captain Cook and his crew and it's, it's so, you know, it's colonialism at its highest level and we mm. know that. But I'm noticing people are really interested and curious to learn and to, to kind of, I think they've obviously not learnt or had much of an experience and that's um, not their fault at all. It's just, the, I guess, that really systemic problem in what's, I guess, taught in the curriculum and I don't know, maybe it's changing now, um, I'm not sure. But um, showing that increased curiosity in, in learning, to, wanting to learn about Yungo culture and Aboriginal culture, I'm definitely finding that that's happening at festivals and little kids are coming up and... Just that, you know, curiosity. I, I, I love that. I love that people. Is definitely, there's definitely this curiosity shining through of people wanting to. And it's a, it's a really honest curiosity in the platform that you're able to showcase uh, or share that cultural touch point that you're talking about. Because, 
you know, post ref referendum where we had like an opportunity to have like great conversations and it just got turned into this media driven mud slinging match of mm. disinformation and all that sort of shit. Mm. Um, you've got songs that you're releasing singing with joy with uh, like messages that you want to share in mm. language. So, yeah. you know, like people are turning up to gigs. They're not just curious, man. They're singing words that they probably don't even know what they're singing. Yeah. But through getting to share that experience of togetherness and connection, they're going to fucking want to know what they're singing about that, and what they're saying. And, and that's just like the most joyful, mm. unobtrusive way to get to the heart of the matter instead of having to decipher like what the fuck is going yeah. on here, you know, with all the different mixed messages that you get. Totally, and man. We were talking about that before, man. And like yeah. you just mentioned it then, Smithy, like – Nothing brings people together better. Like, if you want to see people fucking get angry and tune out, get a room full of people having a fucking argument. Like, if you want to see people get together and start cheering and dancing and singing and getting in the same space, yeah. it's usually at a fucking music concert yeah. or a sporting event. Mm, totally. And I think that's um, a good point because I, I don't know if this like, is from my background working in Aboriginal healthcare, but so much of Aboriginal health care is looked at from what they call deficit discourse which is identifying the weaknesses you know closing the gap is a is a identifying the problems mm. that whole thing so there's a lot more sort of push in in aboriginal health care these days to follow a strength-based approach and so musically that's what we're trying to do i guess is we we're not um we're celebrating culture and what's amazing about Australia and celebrating multiculturalism in a way that's it's it's really pure through a musical sense. Um, I think it's interesting. Australia is we're a funny country, you know. We've got lots of, like I don't want to get too political, and I think that's because. Uh, people in australia can sort of switch off i oh, no, i shouldn't say this maybe maybe i feel like australians or maybe this is a human thing we switch off if people get a bit too preachy mm. you know if something's a bit too preachy we go ah it's it's really important i think for for change and for positive change from my point of view anyways is to celebrate in a way that's not so preachy so that we can come together as one and be you know together as one and sailing in that same boat which is a saying that dr m used to always talk about you know sailing in the same boat together for the brighter future is is something that we're trying to do and i think it's hard it's really hard because you do want to get political and you do want to go there sometimes um but also we're just mates and we're musos playing rock music um people like kind of take look at these really deep meanings behind what we're doing mm. and sometimes it can be really hard like especially in inter interview sense I, f I feel like it can be really hard and it forces you to really think about things a lot more like right now yeah you know because as a muso and as a songwriter and as as a um as a band you're just kind of you're playing songs you don't think about all these things and then people ask these really hard challenging questions yeah, man. Not but saying don't you reckon that also like the whole one of the best things about music is you get what you need out of it and you get what you need out of it is because you're listening when you're yeah. experiencing it you're not talking to the music you're not trying mm. to tell it what you think mm. you just feel something mm. yeah and that feeling is the most powerful thing really in mm. this like i was saying post referendum especially where there was just a lot of sadness a lot of flatness mm. you know people on the people who felt like they'd won by voting no felt where do we go from here and where what's the next step and mm. people who wanted to vote yes felt like fuck where do we where do we go from yeah. here and how do we start to heal and really the only message now is like how do we just come together like that's it and you guys are proof of how we come together Fully. and that's what's yeah. magic about Fully. it you're just brothers on stage mm. and it's like why can't we all just be brothers in the it, crowd or know, sisters bro. in the crowd like yeah. yeah we don't have to layer mm. it with politics and right. history and trauma like mm. all that exists and mm. is real and, and needs to be acknowledged mm. but at the same time like be here 
be in the here and now and fucking connect and and, yeah. and celebrate mm. what we can and you know like for sure like, there's more good to be done stand in a room at a King Stingers gig yeah. than fucking fuck anywhere knows. else in this yeah. country right now guaranteed oh. mate that's that's <laughs> yeah. the truth of it like yeah, you man. come out of it feeling so uplifted and connected to really? to your common uh, man and that that's priceless very few things yeah like we've said can that's do that. music hey yeah. how good's music it just makes you feel so good and mm. that's the core of it the the reason why we love doing this is like is we have so much fun making the songs and yeah. then and then playing them live and we have so much fun performing them and we we hope that people watching us or hearing us fi- can kind of see that joy that we're having and kind of feel something themselves it's like you know that contagious laugh if someone starts laughing you can't help but to like smile and you're like that person's having a good time that thing you know that sort of shared experience is such a awesome yeah I'll, I'll actually i'll just real quickly finish off that story oh, do, uh, do, please. just to to make um listeners realize that i, I wasn't just fully rambling although i was actually <laughs> Mate, we <it's> been, <laughs> spent our lives on this show rambling. all right here we go the ramble continues yeah. um so we were we were uh basically had this one song out and bargain bin the chats um record uh, label um, we're like yeah yeah we, we'll sign you guys and um, we're like hell yeah this is great they're like oh yeah do you want to support us and we're like yeah so we only we had never done a gig at this mm. point and it was our first ever gig at Ipswich in Queensland or was it I think it was Ipswich and then Toowoomba Interesting yeah. uh, choice. Yeah, yeah, this is the home of Pauline Hanson's supporters. Uh, yeah. Which she's from there, and to warm is like where she gets all the votes. But yeah. yeah, it was a funny start, you know, because it was like mm. we we had these we had this one song out. We had songs that we recorded too, and we hadn't actually got the band. We didn't have the band yet, so it was like this is the the music we've done. Well, all right, we got to pull together the band. And so that was our first ever gig. We. We had like this one little run through at d- mum and dad's place and um, it was very wrong and strong. Mm. And Louis came fresh off um, playing in this punk band with Eamon from the chats. So everything was supercharged. Yeah. And we're like, let's just roll with it. And, you know, we love rock music. We love punk music. And, and um, there was very loud and proud, wrong and strong. The Ipswich um, Hotel, or I can't remember what it was, supporting the chats. And it was during COVID, so... We had to perform twice in the one night mm. and we did a bunch of shows during COVID where you perform twice in the one night and if you're doing a tour, you're smashing out the, the sets. Yeah. So it's one way to become tight Shit. and sort of work things out. So um, that's kind of, yeah, in answer to that, like yeah. real lo-fi sort of where are we? You know, the boys fresh from Arnold Man come into Ipswich wow. for a gig. It's like a... Interesting place, but you know, that's Man. music is amazing like that. The places you get to go with music, I feel mm. forever like thinking about that concept where I've been able to go because of music from touring with my dad's band, but touring with our own band now. And you know, we went to the US this year and last year, and and all the regional gigs you get we get to do in Australia where you just it's such an amazing country in Australia that. It's such a big country and there's so much to be seen. We, we, I mean, we've got so many stories of just traveling because mm. you, you do make a lot of memories. What's, what's the most like outpost place you've played? Is it your hometown? Or Probably hometown. Because yeah. <laughs> no, you've got a place called the Hogshed there oh, where yeah. shit gets Iconic. pretty wild, eh? Well, that's where we grew up playing music. Yeah, right. Um, Hogshed is um, started by John Keogh, who's passed now, but he was a, a massive... Um, leader in the community for um, all sort of community programs and mm. projects and, and just an absolute giver. And um, they, the boys, they basically, it stands for Harleys of Gove. And so it's where they would go and take their, their bikes and do a bit of a shine and show. And then it formed into a bit of a jam. And yep. um, and then over the years, have acquired, we've, you know, they've acquired some music gear and it, it's become a jam spot where you go and muck around. And because my dad... Um, such a, a a music lover. He, it's every Sunday is the the hog shed, and you'd go there. So that's it. every Sunday is a hog shed. Yeah, yeah. some and people you, have the church, others have the hog shed. <laughs> yeah, Very and nice. you took uh, Jaleesa and Odie and yeah. uh, Brumby and and all the Bong crew up yeah. there when you were designing or putting this all together. Yeah, yeah. We, we how'd did, they go? 
Oh, it was great. That yeah. fitted straight in. Jaleesa hopped on the drums, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, it's just the, it's the place. And That's so good. Because it's, it's a big tin shed. Mm. Uh, but the people that are there, you know, really make a place, you know. And um, it's, again, a, a real special place because it's where I got to, to learn how to uh, perform, I guess, yeah. in, a, in a real comfortable environment. Because as a young grom, you can be a bit nervous to perform. But you're surrounded by all these oldies who are like, go on, young fella, you know, just give it a crack. It doesn't matter. And they're all on the piss anyways. They don't care what you do. <laughs> so it, it kind of encourages you. Like my dad always said to me, loud and proud, wrong and strong. And that concept I really love. And always tell a lot of people who are um, starting music or wanting to play music is like you're your own biggest critic sometimes. Yeah. And just go to the hog shed and you'll realize that no one really cares. It's... It's just about if you enjoy it, keep going and yeah. those sort of things. But yeah, the the hoggy was great. Um, it always is. Mm. We we I can't remember what we. Oh, actually, we cooked up a big feed and like, I think Oates caught a bag of fish. He he had a good run and Jake from Billabong also cleaned up. So we you got some, waves up there and we got waves up there. What? Finished off at the hoggy. Yeah, it's like little surf shots at Odie doing little. Lazars and uh, did you Lisa get a wave in as well? She was she. I think so. Oh, she yeah. might have had an injury. And actually, did you think you need play? No, no, nah, not that that occasion. Nah, nah. right. No, nah, but they probably were pumping in the car. You know, as we're For on the sure. road. That's awesome. the radio. Well, from the Hulk shed, Smithy, <coughs> all the way to uh, the NRLGF, mate. Eighty what eighty odd thousand people, three million people watching on TV. Like, yeah, that's in two years, mate. That's a that is. Yeah. The most ludicrous rocket ship to the moon. Oh, it's been a, a shift because, you know, grow, from a small town yeah. and that, you know, lifestyle, as you probably guys know from living on the coast here, it's a certain sort of pace. Um, and, you know, m music can be quite a turbo environment, mm. especially festivals and and it's full of extroverted, like, um, yeah. artists and creatives. Yeah. And it can be like... A huge, um, well, it was a, definitely a huge adjustment to life because yeah, well, you can say huge things. nightmare, but no, <laughs> it's both those things. <laughs> no, no, we love it, you know, and and we wouldn't want it any other way. We, we, what I'm sort of saying is the, uh, the tour life is a. We've been giving it a red hot crack. Yeah. You know? um, we've done like uh, I think almost 150 gigs now, um, which seems like. It doesn't seem like a lot, but if you think about it, all the things that go into one gig, this is where I feel like there's a similarity with surfing and music. Because mm. music, like when you're touring, the gig is like a small percentage of your time. It's like yeah. surfing, standing up, riding the wave, such a small moment of that experience. Mm. Yeah. Positioning where to sit in the water, everything. All that time spent in the water. It's like music when you're on the road, all the, the travel and the transiting and the, yeah. the you know... It's yep. there's lots of similarities there, um, but they also complement each other really well. I found mm. so this tour, tour touring schedule when we're really busy, you're in this really noisy environments where you're on the road, airports, festivals, music. You're getting blasted. The ears are getting yeah. whacked. You know, Cup with sound, just yeah. this is like quite an intense, um, you know, stimulus. There's lots going on, and then you get to go home. And you go for a nice quiet surf where it's really relaxing and quite, if it, particularly if it's a small swell, it's yeah. really like quiet. And I love it. I'm like, Pare, this is nice. Yeah, nice man. Yeah, yeah, it's sort of a yin and yang world. Yeah, but yeah there's a lot of sitting around waiting for uh, tiny little moments of, a th of buzz and thrill. Yeah, <laughs> and that's what makes but it all worth yeah, it. The, the good it? thing about music is that when you uh, have a, you know, a ripper and there's people around, they cheer you on, whereas in the surf, everyone just pretends they didn't see you. Oh, no one's giving yeah. you a fucking leg up. It's, yeah. That's the one difference there. Yeah, and the camaraderie I've found in yeah. the music industry is amazing. You know, so many awesome bands who yeah, we're fully. big fans of and then really quickly have become on the same bill as them yeah. and then you're rubbing shoulders with them having a yarn after That's the gig and man. you're just like trying to contain your fanboy your inner fanboy and wanting to not go full like you know yeah but it's the camaraderie is amazing they're just so supportive and you know still you know chat to a lot of people who i've met through the music industry and 
an artist for just like I guess a bit of um, just to chat with, you know, like Sam from Ballpark Music up in Brisbane, the whole band there, they're just so lovely and mm. um, they're very big DIY, do-it-yourself sort of thing and they, I think they grew up down in Lennox here actually, yeah, but the camaraderie is amazing. Yeah, it's good know. to know that because, you know, you look at the golden age of Aussie pub rock and all that, you, you look at your average bill at Bankstown Sports Club and it was, you know, Midnight Oil, Warumpy Band, Red Gum, mm. In Excess, you know, and it was like a $5 or $10 ticket <laughs> yeah. to see like these bands and they're all supporting each other and it created, you know, probably the, the golden age of Australian music, yeah. I would say, in that period. Mm. Uh, and, and it was done with DIY ethos and, and people backing each other. You got, yeah, it's, you know, I, I wonder about what it w- would have been like back in the day, you know, and um, I've been told that like it was a bit more competitive with bands back in, you know, the 80s and stuff mm. where, you know, labels really had a fair bit of control and it was really clicky and it was the the artist was really kind of, um, you know, in, through a lot of different ways um, encouraged to not really uh, be as involved in things because it can make things a bit more tricky. But like, I mean, the bands, the, the artists that you meet on the road – by and large, are all so supportive of you and you're supportive of them and it's this relationship. Like yeah. it was great when we went to Texas for South by Southwest this year and that was a huge experience for mm. like just going and giving it a crack. You got all these fellow artists from Australia but all over the place who were just giving it a go and, you know, it's like you just love I'd, uh, Nothing better than seeing someone just give something a crack, I reckon. Really? And, you know, whether you like their music or not, it doesn't really matter. I just love just creatives having a crack at something and, mm. um, you know, I think that's just the best. Yeah. It is, man. It is. Um, just before we uh, wrap things up, mate, I reckon – thanks for coming in. Rob. No worries. I, I love it. Yeah. I love talking about So you're about living in Ballina now? Yeah, living in Ballina. And you're surfing a fair bit? As much as I can. And what's yeah. the deal with like – so the way that sort of you teamed up with Billabong for this range and stuff is through Otis. So he's a fan of the music and he got in co- contact with you to do some work. Well, I don't really know how it all came into place exactly. Yeah. Like um, we, I think it might've been Oates because I know he was a fan and he would often reach out on our socials and um, share the love, him rocking some merch or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, my mate Brumby, who I grew up with in Nullamboy, yeah. Um, you know Brumby, don't you, Smith? Yeah, man. Yeah. I can't believe you guys grew up together. That's, That's classic. Yeah, yeah man. I mean, yeah. he's a bit older, um, but I used to surf with his old man heaps, who was the other fellow out in the water when we were talking about classic. before. So no way. he's a charger, the, yeah. the original Brumby. Um, you know, and then we reconnected at like beyond, you know, after school and stuff. Yeah. Um, so he's a, a sort of world class cinematographer who helps you shoot videos yeah. for the band and he does a lot of surf stuff with Odie and Billabong and Yeah, yeah, yeah Monster, Monster Children. Children. Yeah. yeah, he's just a legend. He's like one of my best mates. Yeah. We we have had him film every single film clip done oh, no so way. far pretty much cuz you know, he he's just a vibe and when you're doing fun creative stuff, you just want the vibe. That's I know it sounds cliché like that. What's the bloke from the castle? It's the vibe and, uh, no, that's it. It's the vibe. I rest my case. That was sensational. It's just the vibe. Oh, nah, man. The vibe is everything. Yeah, Mm. it is. (laughs) Otherwise, what's, what are you doing it for? You know? Mm. And so we love him and, um, he, a lot of, like he was there, he's a day one, you know, when we were shooting our first film clips, that was what things were, Mm sort of first popping off and he's been with me through all the that adjustment from um you know sleepy little you know northeast arnhem land living yeah um to touring and um that shift um so yeah he's kind of seen the highs and the lows and yeah. me maybe stressing out at things yeah and, you know shit hitting the fan with covid because we only we existed only in a covid time it's only Post COVID, yeah. that we're like, wow, this is freaking awesome yeah. because it was quite stressful. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I didn't want to bring COVID back to Arnhem Land, and 
you know, we were touring oh, and, fully, you know, it was, I was like the paranoid mum with the hand sannies, like, all right, oh, boys, yeah. <laughs> line up. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's like, nah, that'd be brutal to take it up there. But anyways, we won't talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Boy, head spinning. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, all right. So Odie and you guys get together, but I mean, you know, as a surfer growing up, you've already got a connection with, through the Jack McCoy films and stuff. What about the artwork and stuff? Because I noticed that it, you know, the Stingray, hang on, wait, isn't Yipsy's name? Yeah, so that, Yittinger means place of Stingray. Mm. So Stingray so is a really big... That's, uh, yeah, the other founding member of yeah. King Stingray. True. Have you got some good recipes for him? I caught like 10 of them two days oh, ago. Oh, <laughs> River <Road. laughs> Actually, <I'm> mad. <laughs> yeah, well, we, um, whenever, the, so this yeah. is like our second home down this way and when we're on tour because it's so far for the boys to get off country. Yeah. Save them flying back because it's such a long journey. It's often two days to get back, and it's a huge days. Um, they just base themselves either at Tintin Bar, at Mum and Dad's, or mine, or yeah. we get them to stay down here. And this is like in a bit of a holding pattern when we're on the road um, between shows. And we're always going fishing and getting stingray at the Bruns River. Um, yeah, like the boys, we. The, is a bit of parsley and lemon or uh, oh, well, pepper? It's stingray balls. So you'll oh. you'll learn all about it in the King Stingray cooking show we're working oh, on. Oh really? It's, it's another another Mad. um That's fun one we've been Stingray with. fritters. <laughs> yeah. Stingray rissoles. Oh man magic. The, I knew it. This so uh, it's quite a process. So like you get the wings, cut the wings off, boil it oh. quite a lot, and then you, you peel off all the the meat mm. um and you put it in a big bowl and you get the liver it's, li it's all about the liver that's where you get the oils from whoa so you it's the right st at certain times when the stingray is fat and jukur which is actually now in november yep. when the warkar which is like the flower in a lot of the merch um is where's one of the shirts yeah the, grab one can you warkar is a flower that f blossoms when the the stingray is fat and jukur ready to to be oh, eaten. right oh, so no way. it's a full yeah, stingray season. It's a recipe yeah. that's being taught through the plant. Yeah. And you kind of make Before like it. a stingray bliss ball, I guess. It's like you add the liver and that adds the oil and then you you can like make a ball out of it and either fry it up or just boom. Oh, is that the like flour that. there, mate, on that one? Yeah, that's just all the work. Yeah. yeah. There you go. And it, Don't know if you can see Is that. the oil from the Whack liver for taste or for nutrients? Or you, you kind of need the liver. It kind of bind up. Oh, okay. It binds Binder. it all together, but it's also the nutrients and the flavor. But it's all about the liver. You know, if the liver's not right and ready, it's no good. Um, but the namal, the big stingray here, the yeah. boys are frothing because they're massive um, in Bruns River and no one's hunting stingrays. So no one hunts them. No man, one. Every, I don't they're know. Everywhere. I hope, you catch so I hope the many. rangers aren't listening and we're getting the... Travel for <laughs> <laughs> no, I think they're they're on the menu. You can yeah, you can fish them and eat them. We, yeah. Well, I mean, like we had this. We were there recently, a couple of weeks ago. Me and Dimmer, and we we got a friend who, um, from Ireland, runs the art center up there, and he's got a house in Bruns, and they got a kayak there, and we borrowed the kayak, and we're cruising around. We've got the gara, which is the spear, mm. getting a few stingray, and um, this guy was taking photos, and he kind of came up to us afterwards, and he was like, hey. And I thought he was a ranger. I was getting, oh, shit, yeah. we're going to get in trouble. He was like, I've got some photos of you guys. Do you want me to email them? And I was like, I don't know. what. what no, nah, we're good. He's like, yeah, we don't have email. I was saying, like, nah. but then he was like, then um, Dim was like, oh, yeah, we may as well get them. So yeah. I told him the band email and he was blown out. He was no, like, man, I'm a massive fan of King's thing. That's I sick, can't believe, bro. Yeah. That's so good. It That's great. so good. And like a lot of the artwork's designed by it. Yeah, Dimmer. Yeah, Dimmer. yeah. Yep, Dimmer and, and the Billabong. It was, a, it was a full collab where... Um, That's sick. You man. know, Dimmer's an amazing artist. You got the <laughs> mad logo spec T there. Yeah, pub rock classic. Yeah. It's a good combo, man. Like, you must be tripping because, like, you know, Billabong have been supporting us since way back before we were probably... When we were unsupportable. Mm. <laughs> Don't you reckon? Yeah, we're just rambling gibberish. Fucking lunatics saying yeah. whatever we wanted. And, uh, yeah, it took some... Oh. to get him behind it so man totally it's it's a full um living my little childhood dream you know you grow up just yeah. so like billabong is is just like sort of synonymous with being a little grom and really? you know boardies and that whole like uh lifestyle what that represents in lifestyle and then to team up with a surf brand um for me is just like ultimate 
Yeah, man. Um, and especially with the, that lineage with the, you know, your old man's band that you're now in. Yeah. And fucking the McCoy so, films. And yeah. And it's so sick. Like it's, yeah, something I'm, um, you know, music, I, I'm absolute lover of music and surfing and uh, I feel like they do really go well together. Yeah, So man. this is a pretty cool thing. Wish I put little Stingray recipes on the tag, Smithy. Oh, Oh, that's that top secret. Level. You can't. They. Oh no no no! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to overstep the mark. No, no. Um, no we'll we'll work on the. Uh, we've been wanting to do this King Stingray cooking oh, and fishing show. Oh, you got show, it, mate. mate. The catch and cook because Dimmer is a master chef, and um, I mean we all love cooking, and and you know seafood's a really big part of life up there. For it's, sure, it's man. everything up there, and um, the food we get to. Hook into, you know, it's just incredible. And the what are we talking? So, like, what's on the menu? Turtle, everything. Yeah, turtles, big one. Um, and how do you? How do you? I might be blowing open the, the cooking show, but <laughs> no, what, yeah. what's what's the go with <laughs> cooking turtle and eating turtle? How do you do it? Like, or how does it taste? There's there's a few different ways. Um, I'm obviously no expert, so I don't want to be, uh, I guess, commenting on things that I'm not mm. fully across, but. Eating turtle in the past has been, um, you know, whoever whoever caught the turtle, the the um, what do you call it, catcher, mm. the hunter gets the breast, and the best is the best mm. part. Ah. But nothing gets wasted in the turtle, so you can undercook it under the ground in coals. Yeah, and there's all these natural herbs that the um, young will use to cook it up. Wow. Um, but everything gets eaten, and the 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 blood and it's the big. You end up with the big bowl, the oh, big, big shell. Soup. And it's a big soup and it's just like nothing gets wasted. Nah, you that's know? magic. I um, love that, man. But yeah, it's um, that's a, a, a real big one. Um, How would you describe the, the flavor? It's very fatty. Like mm-hmm. uh, it's like, it's, I mean, it's very oily too. It's, it's very like rich. It's like, I mean, you guys got, I don't know, maybe it's a thing you got to try. A um, hundred. Uh, are they, what maybe, are they? Turtles? Are they reptiles? I can't remember what. They're f- a mammal, aren't they? They, they breathe family, oxygen. They, yeah, hot, right. Hot blooded. Lay eggs. Oh, true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the turtle <laughs> eggs are real good. Oh, I don't know, good. I don't know. Oh, I don't know where they're Super on. hydrating too. Like they're full of electrolytes. Like, um, and they don't go hard. Like the the shell, you boil them and it's still soft. Like you pierce them and drink the the yolk. Um, oh wow. Yeah. So what does it look like when you crack a turtle egg? Is it like same color, similar color to white. It's like white. The the, the yolk. The, oh no, the inside the yolk. Yeah. yeah, similar color, but like the it's like a full hit of like the ocean. Whoa, so it's like fishy, man. salt water. But it they're like they'd be so good for you. This um, making me want to go and have some turtle fly. Man, yeah, so good for you. <laughs> man, the the feeds that um Dim is oh. he's a master. Like I remember when we were first doing this um, yeah. Billabong collab yarn. We were doing some. It was like a bit of a design day. And we were on tour on the road and um, poor Bowie had to come up to us because he knows how busy we are. And he's like, yeah. right, well, I'll come up to you guys. Um, and the, the Billabong boys came up and came to our hotel. And we booked like a room there. And um, we were in there um, and Dimmer doing some drawing. And it was like, okay, let's do lunch. The Dimmer was real hungry. He's like, let's go get some food. We like, we're re- reconvening in about 20 minutes. Mm. We're still waiting. Where's Dimmer? He's just like taking a while. And um, then I see, I was like, I'll go on Facebook Live because the boys are always going on Facebook Live. And then I see Dimmer, he's got Bob Marley playing in his hotel room. He's cooking up an absolute storm. Yeah. This is less like down below us. He's gone to, he's found some fish shop like down the road. We're in Chermside in Brisbane. I don't know where he found a fish shop. Mm. And um, he's cooking up a mullet curry. And it looked so good. Nah. Um, and it... Pretty much, he was there for like an hour. We're there waiting for him. <laughs> Come back to the meeting, um, and then he, yeah, he came back, and um, the curry was bloody good. <laughs> nah, yeah, well I just worth found it. out classic because I'm like yeah. trying to keep the train on track, and it's like, you know, Bill hey, mate, like, I it's got bigger it. fish to fry, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Mullet like curry on the go. Bowie and Steve O have have waited for a lot longer than an hour for crew to uh, right. turn up and help me out with some of the things that they're trying to achieve with the Billy's crew. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, we know it. Uh, hey, mate. All right. Well, um, let's wrap it. But what do you got? What's what's next on the on the cards for King Stingray? Because your um, self-titled album came out last year. So yeah. you've had a year of sort of touring that, getting it cracking. And yep. What's your hopes for the band moving forward, man? Yeah. 
Like we're we're having an absolute ball, and like I think for us, it kind of comes back to that um, keep the ball rolling. Yeah. And uh, yucka muck around, which is like no mucking around. We're we've you know been here for a year or two now. Well, the songs have been out for a couple mm. of years now, and we really want to prove to Australia and the world that we're we're giving this our our best shot and um, really enjoying it. For us, we've got lots of music to put out next year. Yeah, we've been recording lots wow. and um, we've got uh, pretty much the album ready to rock. We're, we're going to put out next year a bunch of singles and film clips. We've got a new song coming out in February and the clip's shot by Brumby um, Sick. with some additional footage by a mate of mine down here, Nick Colby, who's a oh, yeah. proud oh, surfer. Ringo. Yeah, yeah. And very good fans of and uh, Mad Ringo Muse as well. Nick Colby, yeah. Hey? Mad Muse as well. Yeah, oh, yeah. well, I, he's an absolute legend. He, yeah. I often get him on the support. He's supported us a bunch in Sydney. Any kicks we've got, I'm always Unreal. hitting up Colby. Um, Fuck, he's going good, man. He's, these yeah. churns are sounding mm. bullshit. He's such a legend. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, like... He's we've we've played a few gigs together. We did one the Byron RSL a little while ago, and he's such a great performer. His songs are really great, but he's an amazing storyteller too. And mm. his new records, bloody unbelievable. Yeah, um, yeah I just yeah, I friggin' love what he's doing. He's such a ledge. We we ripped it up for my dad's um, 60th a couple of weeks ago at Tintin Bar. We yeah. set up the PA and um, we just jam pretty much all day and night and it was one of those days where it was on and off with the rain mm. we had the tarp because we had this pa out in the lawn and we kept putting the covers on you know when there was a big bit of rain coming and then it got to the point where i could hear these tunes going still and it was pissing down rain we put the tarp on and colby's under the tarp <laughs> still with sitting and he's just <laughs> sort of twiddling away right. then i hopped on the kit and we just started jamming it's tarp over us, <laughs> keeping it jam. going under the guava tree, uh, and uh, yeah, it's some bloody good times. All Sounds time. not too dissimilar to the drum circle down in the dunes <laughs> back in Belongil there. True. See a lot of crew under the tarps getting busy with the tunes. Mm, yeah. Mm, yeah, mate. Very, very. Less uh, mullet, curry, more fried rice. That's uh, it, going man. on that thing, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, awesome, Too Roy. Good. Thanks, Heath, no, thanks for um, having me. Yeah, Billy's uh, King Stingray range, I think it drops January 9, 10 which will probably be any day now. So, yeah, yeah, mate, congrats on that and congrats on everything that's been going on. Like Smithy said, it's just fucking such a sick thing to get some strip back. Yolong, yeah. Yolong, fucking, Yolongu? Yongo, yeah. Yongo, yeah. Yongo, fucking surf rock Yeah. Going, so good. Oh, we're pumped. Yeah, brother. Thanks Thank for sharing you. it with us. Thanks for having me. Thank you, brother. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it, man. Cheers. Yeah, dog. Legend. Thank you, bro. Thank you so much. That was great. Pleasure, bro.